six twelve. We're going to read this text and then come back to it in just a bit. So, 1 Corinthians six twelve says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. And so, we're going to come back and reflect on this verse in just a moment as we think about the theme of dangers confronting the family. Um, that's the subject of today's lesson. So, um, I'll open us with a word of prayer, and uh, we'll, we'll dive right into it. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us. Uh, thank you for the Lord's day. We pray, Lord, that you would be honored in our uh, thoughts and attitudes this morning as we open your word and uh, seek to discern what exactly are the dangers that confront the family as we consider uh, how we ought to live in light of your truth uh, and the world's opposition. God, we pray that you would give us wisdom and grace to know how we ought to live. We pray in particular that you would bless us as we worship uh, this morning. We pray that you'd bless Pastor Paul as he preaches. We pray that you would uh, be glorified in our singing, our prayers, our receiving the word, where we want to submit all of our lives to you, but especially uh, this day, we pray that you would be glorified in it, and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So, uh, dangers confronting the family. Uh, this is kind of our next to last lesson in this series on oikophilia, uh, loving the Christian home. And I wanted to, to touch on dangers confronting the family, and just like, what exactly are the forces that are... Um, coming against us as we seek to think about how to live as faithful Christians uh, in our homes. And I'm sure if we were to just take a poll right now, we could come up with a lot of different dangers confronting the family. So I'm just going to focus on one. But I do want to survey some dangers that confront the family. There's so many of them, and they can be overwhelming. So let me just run down some of, some of, these, some of these dangers. Um, all of these, there's obviously a ton to, that could be said, but I'm just going to go through it quickly. Uh, some of these dangers are material, and so we are being conditioned to be discontent with what we have, and so we always need the next new thing, the, something bigger and better and more updated, and so there are material dangers where we're being conditioned by somebody to be perpetually discontent with what we have. Uh, some of these dangers are temporal. We are being conditioned to be busier and busier. And in a place like Auburn, in particular, uh, youth sports demand more and more of us. And it will take your whole life if you, if you would let it, if you don't set some boundaries. Uh, there are um, the pressures of work calling for more and more of our time, and it will consume your soul if you let it. And so we have temporal dangers that confront the home. Uh, another is that there are physical dangers that confront the home. Uh, we, we're being conditioned to be more and more dependent on the cult of personal health. And so pop psychology and so-called mental health ex experts and professionals stand at the ready to counsel you into uh, complete and crippling self-absorption. And so you, you really you can't be crunchy enough. And you can't be, uh, your food can't be clean enough. And your body image can't be perfect enough. And meanwhile, there's this intersection of several industries from mass food to mass entertainment, which has led to more than 38% of Alabamians uh, to be technically obese and more than 10% to uh, a clinical eating disorder. And so we're being conditioned to manifest disorders for ourselves. And there's a multi-billion dollar industry standing at the ready to prescribe enslaving medications uh, to us, now at just the click of a button. You don't even have to go in. And so some of these dangers are ideological, uh, from wokeness to radical Islam to LGBT plus members and their allies to diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, departments and policies to intellectual cultural gurus and media moguls like Jordan Peterson and Joe Rogan and Ben Shapiro um, to religious fundamentalist education cults like Bill Gothard. 
Uh, there, there are dangers on the right and on the left, and we ought to be aware of these ideological dangers. But some of these dangers are also religious. There are false doctrines within the church at large, from Arminianism to hyper-Calvinism, from easy believism to legalism. Uh, Megachurch, multi-site, multi-service models are eroding biblical community and biblical teaching and accountability, and wicked and opportunistic leaders are destroying the faith of God's people. And so these are all dangers confronting the home, and these dangers are coming for you. But their goal is not just to get to you. Uh, the goal is to get to our children. And so besieging and commandeering uh, the hearts and minds of our children in the rising generation is how the revolution happens. And so it can be more than a little overwhelming when you think about all of these dangers that confront the home. Um, it's overwhelming to say the least. And so I, I've put this kind of starkly uh, and strongly because if you're on autopilot um, and you're trusting in classical institutions like the government and public education and legacy media to keep you informed um, and to make everything all right, or if you think that the situation really isn't that dire, um, then you just have to wake up. You have to wake up and see what's going on and pay attention. And so I, I want to focus on just one thing this morning as a danger confronting the family that I think lies at the heart of how our families encounter each of these kinds of dangers. And that particular thing I want to focus on is technology. Um, it's, it's very often through technology that these dangers enter our homes, and in particular into the hearts and minds of our children, even under the, the close watch of the most conscientious and thoughtful parents. And so my point this morning is very simple. It's that Christian families are free to embrace and use technology in our homes. But we should be especially vigilant to keep it in its proper place. And so we should possess our technology, and our, our technology should not possess us. That's really at the heart of the, the message that I have this morning as a danger confronting the family. So what I want to do is give kind of a brief rationale for the good and the danger of technology from Scripture and then talk about how we as Christian families can keep technology in its proper place. So if you've got a Bible, we're going to survey several passages. First is Genesis 1.1. If you need to turn there, you can, but you probably know it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so from Genesis 1.1, we see that the earth is created. Uh, God is a creator. And so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so what that means is God himself is created and a creator and we are made in his image and so we are made to image him and imitate him in certain kinds of ways that accord with our finitude and creaturehood and so it's right to recognize that the the world was been made by god and that we are creators under his ultimate creatorship uh, we it's it's good and right for us to see the world and marvel at god's glory in it and to seek to make proper use of it so that's just kind of a foundational principle that God created all these things and they're to be received as good because God said that it was very good. Um, Exodus 31, verses 1 through 6. Exodus 31, 1 through 6. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, and with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood, to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed him with Aholiab, the son of uh, Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, and I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. And so here's a particular in, like, interesting section where in the construction of the tabernacle, there are people that are given particular gifts and skills not to just take something that is out there like a big giant rock and then just move it somewhere else and place it, but to carve it and work it and to develop it into something that's better than it was, to take raw material and to run it through a, a process that's both creative and 
uh, productive, to make it into something better than it was. In this way, they are um, subduing the earth, exercising dominion over it, bringing all things under uh, the dominion of man and ultimately under the lordship of Christ. And so God gifts people to uh, cultivate raw materials from the earth and use it for human purposes, and in this situation, even for religious purposes of worship. Look with me now at Second Chronicles 26. Second Chronicles 26, verse 15. It says here, In Jerusalem he made machines invented by skillful men, and to be on the, ta- uh, to be on the towers and the corners, uh, to shoot arrows and great stones, and his fame spread far, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. And so here's a, here's a picture of someone being commended uh, for their inventiveness and create, creativity. They've made machines that were invented by skillful men. And this isn't portrayed as some sort of usurping of divine creative um, imagination, but this, they're being commended here. Uh, th- these were particularly defensive uh, machinery, and it led to the, the, the spread of his fame, and he was helped by these things. And so I think we see here another example of uh, the Lord giving and equipping men and women for the cultivation of raw materials to create things that uh, make human society better, uh, and like actually better, not just more convenient, but just actually better. Look now at Psalm 8. Just keep on going over, just hitting some of the high points here. Psalm 8, uh, verse 3. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little while lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet. And here we see a a statement of all things are put under the feet of man. Um, And this is ultimately a reference to Christ. All things are under his feet. But we see even in a a more temporal way, um, you've given him dominion over the works of your hands. So the works of God's hands, creation, is under the, the stewardship and responsibility of man to cultivate and create it, to work it and to keep it, and to maximize its potential for human good. Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22. Verse 29. It says, Do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. And here this proverb is is not a negative of like human selfish ambition, sinful selfish ambition. This is a a commendation of a person who's skilled in their work, not just punching the clock and doing enough to get by, not just punching the clock and doing enough to stay out of trouble, but someone who's really thriving in the work that he was made to do, really putting his heart and soul into it without having his heart and soul consumed by it. He will stand before kings. In other words, it's right to be uh, to, to enjoy the fruit of your labor. Do not muzzle an ox while he's treading out the grain, the proverb says. And so it's right that we use our work and our skills and our gifts to uh, promote human flourishing in various kinds of ways. And it's right that we receive benefits and blessings from it and share those benefits and blessings with others. Now, 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. It says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So here's this kind of totalizing statement that, that we can do all things to the glory of God. Um, there's lots of different kinds of things that we can do that are lawful. And whatever we find to do, we ought to do it to the glory of God. We opened our time this, this morning with 1 Corinthians six twelve. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me but I will not be dominated by anything. And so we have permission from God to do anything that doesn't contradict his his law, his command. And among those things that are are not sinful to do, we ought to be discerning about what things are most helpful and what things have a tendency to dominate us. 
we are not permitted to be dominated by anything in terms of the things that we could do with our time and with our effort. So uh, we have a responsibility to discern how we use technology and the works of our hands. Uh, and now Romans one twenty one. Romans 1, 21 to 23. It says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And so here we see Paul's recognition that for all of the creativity and imagination and skill and dominion that mankind has and should have, things don't tend to stay in their proper place. These things that we make that are good things to be enjoyed and received with gladness, things that we can use for the glory of God, has a tendency to dominate us, to enslave us, and we have a tendency to use them for selfish ends for sinful, selfish ambition, for things that promote other kinds of vices like laziness um, and gluttony. And so just like uh, the the sins mentioned here, we can take God's good gifts and distort them and not view them with reference to God who made them and who made us. And uh, claiming to be wise, they became fools. We can have the best of intentions with our use of technology and other kinds of gifts of God. But And it can seem like the way of wisdom, but in the end, it's actually foolishness. There's a way that seems wise, but in the end, it leads to death. So I want to kind of set all this in the context of technology because technology fits, it it ticks all these boxes of ways that we exercise dominion and stewardship. And so technology in itself is not a bad thing, but it can be. And it can be one of the most efficient and prevalent modes of danger to the family as it is an instrument that introduces chaos and all of those uh, dangers that I talked about from the, from the physical and material to the ideological and religious. So as we talk about how to keep technology in its proper place, I just want to affirm that there is a proper place for technology in our families and in our homes. So as we talk about technology in its proper place, let me just commend the work of Andy Crouch and his book, The TechWise Family. Now, Andy Crouch personally is not like a 1689 Reformed Baptist, so this isn't a full endorsement of everything he's ever said in his life. I'm commending this book as a good book. Uh, I read it years ago. I recently reread it. It's called The TechWise Family, Everyday Steps for Putting Technology in Its Proper Place. It's really good. If you are a parent, especially, you need to read it, Um, however old your kids are. um, You should read this book. It's worth buying. It's worth reading. It's worth reading out loud with your spouse. Uh, If you've got older kids, it's worth reading with your kids or having them read it and discussing it. 10 out of 10 recommend. Um, So a lot of my reflections are drawn from from him. So um, I guess at the heart of it, keeping technology in its proper place, parents don't want our kids to become addicted to screens. That's really kind of a, a kind of a basic principle. We don't want our kids to become addicted to screens, but kids often see that their parents are addicted to their screens. And so in many ways, our kids are competing with our screens for our time and for our attention. And in the most intimate setting of, of the household, where the deepest human work of our lives is meant to take place, technology distracts and displaces us far too often, and it undermines the real work of becoming persons of wisdom and courage. And that's really at the heart of the danger that I see and that I want us to think about together as a church is how technology can displace us and distract us in the home. So it's, it's a danger of attention. We, there's, a, there's, an, and there's an attention economy. And every time you watch a YouTube video, you are a participant in the attention economy. Every time you see ads, then you just like can't wait to click skip ad on the video. You're participating in an in, in attention economy. Every time you open Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever it is, um, you're, partici- you're a participant in the attention economy. 
And so we need to be aware of how our attention is being commandeered and directed to other things that distract us and displace us from the home. And so if we don't learn to put technology in all of its forms in its proper place, we're going to miss out on many of the best parts of life in a family. And so I guess the first danger of technology not being in its proper place is when it, when it commandeers our attention and di- distracts us and displaces us from our full presence in the home. And I'm speaking mostly of parents here. That, you know, multiply that when it's our children who are distracted and displaced uh, by screens in our homes. And so um, on, on this note of kind of the dangers of technology, I'm not going to particularly focus on pornography, um, but just on technology more generally. Um, though you should know that more than 30% of Internet use is for pornography. More than 62% of teenagers have received sexually explicit images on their phones. More than 40% of teenagers have sent sexually inappropriate images to someone else. So this is a major deal. Uh, So Andy Crouch says that if we build our family's technological life around trying to keep pornography out, we will fail. And so instead, the best defense against pornography um, is, and and, and that's applied to every member of the family, is is a full life. And note that that's not the same thing as busyness. You can't busy it away. But to have a full life, it's worth reflecting on what does it mean for our family to have a full life as we think about how to keep technology in its proper place, and how that might be an aid to uh, guarding us against pornography and its prevalence in our culture, it's, it's to have a full life. Again, it's not just, that doesn't equate to a full calendar or full schedule, a full planner, but to have a full life. And that requires wisdom. What does it mean to have a full life? What does it mean to cultivate values of wisdom and courage in our homes? Um, what, what would it look like for our family's life to be full and so full of joy and life that some of the displacing and distracting elements of technology and some of its more sinister applications, for instance, like pornography, just, there's just not a place for it. Um, so the, 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 the pace of technological change has, has really surpassed anyone's capacity to develop enough wisdom to, to handle it all. And so... Um, we, we need wisdom. No, no one has sufficient wisdom to have mastered how, the, the whole thing. We, we need wisdom. And it's, that means that technology is, and the use of it is proper place in the home isn't going to look the same for every family. And it's not going to be the same in the same family at different periods of time. And so we, we need wisdom and discernment. It's not a simple formula. And so there's always a sense of pressure that says, you know, everybody's doing this. Everybody is watching this program. Everybody is utilizing this device. Everybody is, um, you know, on using this curriculum, whatever it might be, um, and whatever mode of delivery. And our children need to hear from us over and over again that our family is different. As Christian homes, we are different. We are distinct from the world. We may have some areas of overlap, but we are distinct from the world. And there are things that other people do that we simply cannot do out of faithfulness to Christ. There are some things that we could do in faithfulness to Christ, but shouldn't do as an exercise of wisdom and discernment. And then there are other things that are really neither here nor there and are just a matter of preference. We need to keep those categories in place. Um, and we need to teach our family, our children in particular, that our family is different from others. We make decisions based on what is right according to God's word and according to prudence that he has given to us. So we're, we're going to have to teach our children from very early on that we're not here fundamentally to make everything easy for them, but to make their lives better, to point them to Christ, to help them to flourish and and develop as whole people and not just to uh, to have easier, more convenient lives. So that's really uh, at the heart of how, how Andy Crouch is framing the book about how technology promises easy everywhere. And there's this driving influence of of making things easier and easier but it's not making anything better um and so uh efficiency doesn't always lead to an actual like better quality of life and so some of the things that he emphasizes in the book that i think are helpful are you know ways of cultivating things in your homes 
that rewards skill. And so um, maybe just to transition to that, we, we can't let technology overwhelm us with its default settings, and it can't, we can't allow it to take over our lives and stunt our growth in all the ways that really matter. And so uh, we, we need to latch on to some really important principles here. And so one of the, one of the things that's a mark here, so these are five marks of how technology should be in its proper place. Uh, one is technology is in its proper place when it helps us acquire skill and mastery of domains that are the glory of human culture. I'll say that again. Technology is in its proper place when it helps us acquire skill and mastery of domains that are the glory of human culture. So things like sports, that's a real value. And it has classically been a value all the way back to the ancient world. So we can utilize technologies that help us become better athletes and to take dominion over our bodies to the extent that we can within our finitude. And so technology is in its proper place when it helps us acquire skill and mastery of domains that are the glory of human culture. Things like music. So for him, instead of like just turning on Spotify or Hey Alexa or Hey Google, whatever, um, when we think about playing music, have an instrument in your house and everybody try to learn how to use it. Maybe it's a piano that's located in the center of your house that when there's downtime and you're tempted to just have this white noise of a TV on in the background. Instead of doing that, do something active that helps to cultivate a skill and, and mastery of an instrument like a guitar or a piano or a violin or something like that. Uh, other kinds of arts, uh, like, like fine arts, I mean, like painting and drawing, um, from whether it's sidewalk chalk to like oil painting on a canvas, it doesn't really matter. There are things that we can do in, in, that are gonna be productive in cultivating um, skill and mastery that are easier, or they're, they're not easier is the point. They're, there's, it's more work, but it's better. Just because it's easier doesn't mean it's better. And so uh, other things like cooking, uh, cooking together, um, writing. Uh, so, I mean, the list could go on and on of ways that uh, there are conveniences of modern technology that might make our lives more efficient and easier, but not necessarily better. And so when we let technology replace the development of skill, then we basically slipped into a kind of passive consumption and something has gone wrong. And when that passive consumption is the character of our home, then we're training children to be passive consumers. You can't train your children to be active producers while the home, the most central place in the life of, in, in our lives, is a, is, a, is a culture of passive consumption. So it could be that the, the proliferation of technology, uh, especially screens at these early and early ages, they, they, will, they may well be remembered as one of the most damaging epidemics of the 21st century. Long, long, when, when COVID is long forgotten, it may be that the proliferation of screens and how it has crippled our, the, the rising generation of skill and mastery of things that are the most important for our culture. It's, it's that proliferation of screens that will be the true epidemic that we look back with regret. Um, so a, a second way that technology can be in its proper place is when it helps us cultivate awe, A-W-E, uh, for the created world that we're, that we're part of and responsible for stewarding. So we can, we can use technology to help cultivate awe. So again, we're not anti-technology. This isn't some like Amish vision. Um, it's not that. We can use technology to cultivate skill and mastery of arts and crafts that make culture wonderful. We can use technology to cultivate awe for the created world. And so I'm thinking about like going to a museum, going to like the McWayne Center, uh, watching Planet Earth on whatever it's on, is it Netflix now? I don't know, um, Blue Planet. There's like really cool things that you can use technology for that even involve screens. You can use your phone to like do some kind of like scavenger hunt. Uh, there are things that, there are programs and apps that do that, but it, it's ultimately directing you and your attention and your fascination and sense of wonder to the created world that God has made. And so technology is out of its proper place when it keeps us from engaging the world uh, with all of our senses. So technology that keeps us cloistered in our homes, in dark rooms with glowing screens, and keeps us away from the, the world that God's made, 
that's when it's out of its proper place. A third way it's in its proper place is when it helps us take care of our fragile bodies. Um, and so technology can be a great help. Uh, we we love, like, it, medical technology is a wonderful thing. People don't have to die of the flu anymore. Um, so we, we, we're not rejecting how technology can help us in our physical health uh, by any means, but technology can be in its proper place when it helps us to actually take care of ourselves. And it's out of its proper place when it promises to help us to escape our limits and vulnerabilities of our bodies. And so technology is out of its proper place when it is trying to get us to transcend our finitude and put our hope in some sort of immortality or endless existence through technology. Um, a fourth way that technology is in its proper place is when it helps us to start great conversations. And so it's out of its proper place when it prevents us from talking with and listening to one another. And so I don't know how many times you go into a restaurant and it's very obvious, here's like a college couple and they're at this table for two and they're both on their phones. It's like, that's, that's true love right there. Um, and no, it's not true love. That's ridiculous. Why, why are you doing this? Like, why are you out at an expensive restaurant and both just glued to your phones watching Instagram reels, uh, whatever it is? Um, and so th there are ways that technology can help us to be uh, basically in isolation, even while we're in the presence of other people. And we're all guilty of it. I'm just going to speak for everybody. We are all guilty of this. Um, of, I mean, I'm guilty of it. You know, at home, in the living room with my family, like playing Minesweeper on my phone. Um, and like, I, I do it. And that's not the most productive thing to do. Um, what's so ironic is, like around Christmas time, I like I completely deleted all social media. I'm off of all social media, and I felt a real sense of like self righteousness about this. Like I escaped the system, and I've just replaced endlessly doom scrolling on Twitter with endlessly playing Minesweeper, and it feels I feel so much more like righteous as a result. But it's the same thing. I've just substituted one time-wasting distraction and displacement technology with another. And so what I'm, what I'm getting at is it may be that you need to make a convictional exit from social media. You may be way too online. And I think more Christians should leave social media than do. Um, but you need to be on guard about what you're going to replace that time with. Because you might think you're going to replace it with Bible reading, but you probably aren't. And you just need to be aware of that. How, how, can, how can I, if I'm, gonna, if I'm going to convictionally change my rhythms of how I'm going to use technology and how it distracts and displaces me, I'm going to convictionally get out of that mode. I'm going to be present. How are you going to do it? You need to have a plan. And you need to communicate that plan to somebody else that's going to help hold you accountable to it. Because it's one thing to say, okay, I'm not going to, you know, doom scroll on Instagram or just endlessly go through YouTube shorts or whatever it might be, what are you going to use that time with? Because you will probably find something else to waste it on that's not productive, and it's probably also going to be on your phone. So I'm, I'm living it right now, and I'm trying to figure out how to stop. So technology is in its proper place when it helps start great conversations. There are ways that you can use technology that actually facilitate relationship, facilitate conversation, facilitate in-person interaction, which is a superior mode of interaction. So lastly, technology is in its proper place when it helps us bond with real people that we've been given to love. And so it's out of its proper place when we end up bonding with people at a distance, like celebrities whom we'll never meet. So even at their best, social media, like all media, substitute distant relationships for close ones. And so one of the great gifts of technology is the simulation of presence at a distance. So we're not anti-Zoom calls or anti-FaceTime. When we FaceTime with my parents who live three hours away, it, there's a, it's, it's not an actual, pre they're not actually present, but it's a simulation of presence. Their voice is there, a video of them is there, but they're physically not there. And that simulation of presence is better than absence, but it's not the same as presence. 
And so that's why like phenomena like virtual church and online church is an act- it's a biblical contradiction because the church hasn't gathered when we've all logged into the same website. And so physical presence is essential to the ontology of the church, to the being of the church. And so technology is in its proper place when it helps us bond with real people that uh, we have been given to love. It's out of its proper place when we end up bonding with people at a distance, like celebrities in particular, whom we'll never meet. And so we can celebrate the gift of the simulation of presence, but we can't be dependent upon it. We can't use it as a substitute for real presence. So even the, the highest quality remote connection is not enough for the really important moments in human life. Imagine how it would go if I had a nurse FaceTime me into the delivery room when my kids were born. It's, it's just different. It's not the same. And like me being FaceTimed in there with a nurse holding the phone, watching Louise be born or whatever, it's not the same as me being there. Um, certainly Kat couldn't be FaceTimed in to do that. Um, and so our physical presence in those moments that are most important, in particular things like the births of children and funerals, graduations, weddings, these kinds of significant moments, uh, technology really can give the appearance and simulation of presence without the substance. So any, any sort of mediated presence is just a pale shadow of what it's like to be with another person, uh, face-to-face, uh, present in the fullness of who we are. And so we should cultivate technology uh, that helps us bond with real people in real time directly. So those are just a few principles for how to keep technology in its proper place. Notice it's not a step-by-step guide. It's not a law of you may not give your child a smartphone until they're 18. Um, It's not, you know, if I find out that your kid's on Facebook before he's 10, then you're going to be in big trouble. It's not that sort of thing. We have to have some principles in place about how we're going to use technology. Don't assume that, of course, we're going to do what everyone else is doing unless there's a reason not to. No, it's we should intentionally incorporate things in our lives, not simply things that make our lives easier, but things that make our lives better. And by better, I mean things that cultivate godliness, things that cultivate good conversations, the mastery of skills, uh, real relationships and bonds between real people in real time, uh, things that cultivate meaningful personal connections, things that cultivate wisdom and courage in the home. And so there are ways that technology can be a a kind of Trojan horse for all of those bad dangers in various domains that I mentioned at the beginning. But it doesn't have to be that way. There's a a feeling of inevitability, like it's going to happen. My children are, they're going to be addicted to pornography. It doesn't have to be that way. That's not an inevitability. We can cultivate characters by the way that we steward technology. And we can intentionally implement practices and limitations and boundaries in our homes that help us be aware of the dangers that are out there that train our children's characters to be able to handle it responsibly. So I don't have like a magic fix. My, my oldest kid is eight. So like I, we haven't really crossed that bridge yet. And so I'm interested to hear from some of you who have crossed that bridge, things that have been helpful, things that maybe haven't been helpful. Um, so we've got some time. So let me just ask, are there any questions or comments about keeping technology in its proper place. Allison.
Yeah, that's a that's a good point. There's a way to, you know, approach the use of technology, especially tablets and screens with our kids, as a way to kind of shut them up and get them out of our hair, out, out of sight, out of mind. And that that would be certainly not an appropriate use of technology. Uh, Jennifer. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, one principle you could have is just not to let the TV show or the movie have the last word. Um, you know, when you your kid's watching Paw Patrol or um, Spider-Man, whatever it is, um, talk to them afterward. You know, what was something that was interesting to you about that show? Was there anything that s stood out to you as kind of weird? Who was the good guy and who was the bad guy? Did you... Yeah, did did you did you want the good guy to win, or were you kind of cheering for the bad guy? Um, like, who do you think was, you know, trying to do the right thing? Uh, we can have that kind of debrief after, you know, a TV show or movie. It's a really important step to help our children process and interpret. So even when there's something in there that you're like, wow, we really wish they didn't do that, it can become a, a teaching moment to train your children to be discerning, so that when there's a cartoon where, you know, the little dinosaurs got two dads. Okay, that was weird. Why was that weird? Why do you think that was weird, Henry? Yeah, it is weird when, you know, there's someone that has two dads. You can't really have two dads. And so, yeah, help the, help our kids to, I mean, ideally, when they're super young and being formed, you, you want to limit exposure to that sort of thing. But when that sort of exposure does happen, helping them to have a category for how to interpret it. Um, Caleb? Yeah, I guess the the point is to there, there needs to be some boundary, uh, some some limitation that is uh, discerned with wisdom, and moms and dads need to be on the same page about that. What that boundary is, Colin.
that's a good word. Well, let's, let's pray together and, uh, and, and move along. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the gift of technology. God, we do recognize it as a gift that can be uh, used to great purpose to really make our lives better. But God, we just recognize how prone we are to misuse it, how we can turn on autopilot in our souls, especially with our young children. And God, we pray that you'd help us to be vigilant and attentive, uh, that you'd help us to embrace the responsibility that you've entrusted us with, uh, that you would help us to remember your promises, um, and that you really would help us to be vigilant, to be obedient to all your will. We pray that you'd give us grace and patience uh, for these these tasks. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, we can re-gear for corporate worship in just a few minutes, but if you have children in Sunday school, now's the time to get them.